I'm here with Christian Pyatt. Christian is a popular speaker, author of numerous books, including the Banned Questions of the Bible series, the Surviving the Bible series, and Post-Christian. He's also the founder and owner of Brew Drinkery, a community cafe and brew pub in Granbury, Texas, which I will be very anxious to come visit once we're through the pandemic. <laughs> um, Christian has a new book called You Can't Ask That, 50 Taboo Questions About the Bible, Jesus, and Christianity. And uh, let me read a little part of the blurb from the back cover. Um, edited by Christian Pyatt, who once had a Bible thrown at his head during Sunday school for asking too many questions, this book gathers 50 of the most provocative, challenging, and hard-to-answer questions and fields them to a diverse group of religious professor, professors, pastors, and other faith leaders for their response. So, Christian, thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. So, um, I'd really love to hear a little bit more about the things that you, you did before getting to this book, you know, how you got started in writing and all the different books that you published. Sure. Um, my passion for books and, and writing uh, kind of goes as far back as I can remember. Uh, my parents had an old uh, manual, I guess that's what you would call it, a manual typewriter, you know, uh, sure. you get the carpal tunnel and tendonitis from making the keys go down and um, and I, I dug it out and would draw, um, uh, I would draw columns and draw, you know, illustrations and, and write, uh, my own articles in about, uh, the neighborhood and just, you know, what was going on. Well, you know, the, Joey, Joey took Christian's big wheel for a ride around, you know, and or, around the neighborhood yesterday and. Uh, the horse apple tree is is really dropping big, you know, big horse apples this year. So it's just mundane stuff. But I was trying to, I was playing at writing, you know. Um, and um, my my parents were always avid readers. Uh, my mom uh, is, has has been a, a an avid reader of books her whole life. My dad is a more periodicals kind of guy. Um, and I kind of picked up on the passion for, for both of those, um, worked, uh, you know, with the student newspapers and the yearbook and things as I grew up, um, wrote collections of poems. I, I wrote scads of plays and short stories and full books that nobody will ever see. Thank <laughs> God. <laughs> um, don't want those to see the light of day, but they were good practice. And uh, then around 2007, um, I was starting to do some writing uh, in different places. I had started uh, by, uh, I was, at that point I was doing any kind of writing uh, I could. So if somebody offered me uh, an opportunity to do a restaurant review, uh, even though I had known nothing about food reviews, <laughs> I said, yes. <laughs> uh, there was uh, a, a newspaper, a local business, press, uh, like a weekly business paper. I didn't know anything about uh, business at the time, but they offered to let me do a feature on this guy who was like a vice president of an oil and gas company. Why? I have no idea because I had no background in that whatsoever. But uh, of course, I always said yes to whatever assignments came my way, uh, whether it was a 50 word blurb uh, about a, a record review um, in a in a monthly periodical in Austin, or or whether it was re reviewing a dance troupe in Pueblo, Colorado, uh, I just I did all of them, uh, and ultimately I started getting some opportunities uh, with a local paper, and I started doing uh, some arts and culture reviews for them, uh, and then eventually a few features, um, human interest kind of stories. And from there, they um, asked me if I wanted, because it, at that point, I had already started a church with my wife, Amy, in Southern Colorado. And uh, they had an opportunity. They had a faith uh, section in their local paper uh, that was run by a former Catholic priest, <laughs> uh, great guy, uh, Marvin Reed. And uh, we had become friends and I, I, they offered me a weekly uh, spirituality column and it just kind of blew me away. Uh, 
And so I started getting this practice of, of formulating my ideas and crystallizing my thoughts um, into a very specific format and, and uh, uh, I started honing my craft that way and then started uh, soliciting uh, writing for magazines and things like that. I wrote for, for uh, Disciples of Christ uh, magazine uh, for a while. I uh, started doing some writing for uh, what was called the Ooze at the time, which was a progressive uh, Christian uh, online website. Um, and then Sojourners and Red Letter Christianity, uh, Pathios, Huffington Post. Uh, and I, I submitted a proposal to Chalice Press, which is our denominations press and uh, publishing division. And they turned it down. Uh, it was like on um, spirituality and spoken word uh, kind of thing. And I said, that's all great, but this is a book. And most people don't know how to read, perform these things, and they would need you to do it. It's more of a performative piece than it is a, a reading piece. Uh, but we really like your writing, and we like your theology, we like your, your, your ideas. Would you write this other book? And, of course, I said, yes. <laughs> what's, it, what's it about? And I <laughs> said, it's about this TV show called Lost. And are, uh, do you know it? And I was like, no, and of course I know it. And, uh, you know, a huge fan, love, love the series. They, well, they want, you to, they want me to write a, a book on the theology, uh, theological symbolism in the show Lost. And I got off the phone and I told Amy, I said, we have to go to Best Buy right now. This was in 07, <laughs> back during the era of DVDs. I was like, we got to buy every season of Lost and we have to start <laughs> power watching it because they want me to finish this book in like two and a half months. And uh, I, I hadn't even watched one episode of the show yet. So, oh, my. Oh, my. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I binged, watched, and I got the book done. And uh, that's sort binge of a, wrote. <laughs> Yeah. And I binge uh, wrote for sure. Uh, and uh, I learned how to work on a deadline and in a very uh, prescribed uh, uh, format, you know, uh, very quickly. And it was a, it was a great discipline. It was a great experience. And I guess as a concession for that, they asked me if I wanted to write uh, my own book uh, at that point after that. And uh, so then they let me pick what I wanted to write about. And, and I went from there. I've, I've done a over, I think over a, uh, 12 or 13 books since. Um, hmm. Although this book's a with uh, Chalice. No, I, uh, I did one, uh, I, I did several with, uh, uh, Augsburg Fortress. Okay. Um, I did a couple on my own, uh, crowdsourcing, uh, crowdfunding the, uh, the money to hire freelance designers and editors and stuff. Uh, I did a novel and I had Frank Schaefer, uh, edit that for me. Um, and, uh, yeah, I've done a number uh, with Chalice Press, and then I did one with, uh, gosh, I can, now I'm having a mental block. It's not Harper One, but it was one of the other. Um, Thomas Nelson made, and Hodderman, or No, it was, uh, oh my gosh, anyway, it was like one of the Random Houses, and you know, or one of those in their, their Christian division. Oh, uh, Conversion? So, uh, it wasn't Conversion, it wasn't Harper <laughs> One, it was, and I can't say Whatever. it. Whatever, that's all right. Yeah, they, they came and went. I'm totally drawing a blank, but I did a hardcover for them. And, and, uh, uh, and anyway, I just kept writing. I did a few things for time magazine and, and, uh, you know, online, um, and some other outlets online. And, uh, since it's just always been a part of my life, I guess. Wow. That's quite a saga. I'm always fascinated on how people get their first book deal. Yeah. Just the stories are so unique and just so many times are out of the blue, you know, yeah. kinds of things like what you're describing. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Writing all the time in all places, in all formats, for all audiences, for the practice and saying yes to every opportunity with the keys <laughs> for me. Yeah. Uh, and almost got myself in trouble that way, but it, it worked out. So there's a couple of series that, you know, I mentioned when I was introducing you. One's called the Band Questions of the Bible series, and the other is Surviving the Bible series. Can you talk a little bit about those two? 
Yeah, the uh, band questions about the Bible is actually the series that inspired uh, the You Can't Ask That book. And actually, this is sort of like a greatest hits of the band question series. OK, so um, I wanted to. So you mentioned that I had a Bible thrown at me uh, when I was a, a kid in youth group. Uh, I uh, it was for asking the wrong questions. And uh, so uh, I decided uh, once I finally had the opportunity to, that I wanted to explore those kinds of questions because I found out a lot of people had them. Um, and in my understanding of Christianity, there were no wrong questions. There were no bad questions that there are asked in earnest. And so uh, we, I actually, it was early on for me, at least in my uh, work online, it was around 2009 or, or 10, I guess. Um, and I would, uh, I didn't know what it was called at the time, but I crowdsourced questions, uh, and then had people vote on which ones, uh, were the most compelling to them. Uh, and then I assembled a, a group of people for each one of the books. We had banned questions about the Bible, banned questions about Jesus and banned questions about Christianity. And each one had 50 questions and each one had a couple dozen respondents, uh, writers uh, from different perspectives, from uh, an, a, an agnostic, uh, cultural, culturally Jewish uh, casting director in Hollywood, to a seminary professor, uh, to f f filmmakers and artists and activists um, of all types. And so I would pick several of them to respond to each question. Uh, and it, we would mix it up. So uh, you would always have um, at least two, if not four or five responses to every question, uh, because the idea was to give you enough rich content for discussion and thought to arrive at your own conclusions. Uh, so that was what that series was based on and what inspired this book. Um, and then the Survive in the Bible series came, that was the, the one I did with Augsburg Fortress. Uh, it was a three book series as well. Uh, I seem to write in threes. And um, it was, uh, came from the realization that a lot of my friends who were uh, more mainline or progressive Christians had grown up in a more fundamentalist environment and knew in their heart of hearts, they felt in their guts that there was something off uh, that just didn't fit for them. But they also tended to reject the biblical knowledge and scholarship that was one of the great rigors and disciplines, I think, of uh, evangelical and fundamentalist uh, Christianity. And having grown up Southern Baptist, you know, we, we knew our texts. <laughs> and I thought, well, it, maybe it's because there aren't any resources for people who are in the mainline and progressive sides to really understand their Bible in a way other than literally, um, didactically. And so I wrote a, a series of books three years in a row based on the lectionary, you know, which is the liturgical calendar that goes through sure. uh, the Bible in three years. And so I wrote for each week, I wrote uh, uh, devotionals, uh, studies, commentaries, stories, and resources uh, for that week to help people navigate the text, to go through the entire Bible uh, in three years, uh, but not memorizing it and not having to just take it literally uh, at its face. More of a Midrashic, ancient, uh, Judaic approach to the scripture. Hmm. So, yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. So, um, you know, you, in this book, you include blurbs from you know, several folks that, uh, you know, I work with too. Uh, Carol Howard Merritt, Matthew Paul Turner, Margot Starbuck, David Lose. Um, so I'm, I'm curious how you went about establishing relationships with those and all the other folks that you got involved in this. Yeah, um, it, it really came from a couple of things. One uh, was just actively reaching out and offering to write uh, for anybody on anything, on any deadline, uh, you know, uh, to just get my work out there and to get my, as we'd say in the music 
ebb is, you know, get my chops up <laughs> and, uh, and just to get the practice. And uh, so I found the people who, whose work and words and ideas inspired me. And then I tried to approach those outlets uh, where I found them uh, to write alongside them. And as I would, I would try to reach out and just communicate with those authors who I respected and to engage in a thoughtful dialogue. And uh, I would always try to be very intentional about mentioning something very specific and personal that I liked that they had done that meant something to me rather than just, hey, you're great, you know, translated, you have a big platform and I hope there's something in this relationship for me <laughs> versus I see you as a person, I, I acknowledge your work has made an impact on me and I'd like to know you on a more personal level. Um, and so a lot of those relationships have carried on for more than a decade since. Um, and so when we had this opportunity to write this, uh, to write the band questions books and now, uh, that you can't ask that book, which is uh, pulled, excerpted from those three uh, band questions books. Um, I had a wealth of people uh, to draw from. Uh, and I had also at that point gotten involved with the Red Letter Christians, uh, Tony Campolo's uh, sure. group, and uh, Brian McLaren and Shane Claiborne, um, and also uh, gotten connected with Jim Wallace and, and Kathy, Kathleen Falsani at the time uh, over at Sojourners and uh, really started to connect with a lot of writers that way, started getting invited to speak at some conferences and such. And of course, the after hours times at those kinds of meetings are where the real fun happens and the real substance. And uh, so I made some lifelong friends out of that and, and they were happy to jump in and, and play in this uh, sandbox for a while. Isn't it so amazing, you know, the power of networking and establishing relationships and how down the road they can be so incredibly helpful in ways that you never even imagined absolutely and and i think uh you know uh, any author uh if you have a lot of uh, folks who who watch your stuff or listen to your stuff who are writers or aspiring writers can probably relate to the fact that uh once you are a published writer you get a lot of inquiries of people wanting something from you wanting an endorsement or a blurb in their book or for you to publicize their stuff, you know, write about it on their blog or mention it on their podcast or whatever, which is all fine. I understand that's part of the business. That's part of the game. But I always responded better to people who offered, who, who understood what I was about and not just that I was a name, a mark, a name on the marquee, you know, that they wanted to try to use to get, their own word out. Um, and if they offered something back to me, hey, you know, I would love to see if we could maybe trade off uh, blog posts or if I could have you on my podcast and maybe you'd like to ch check out my book or something like that. Um, so it was an ex a more equitable exchange. And I think those kind of relationships, um, well, that's just it. They're more equitable. And, and when your relationships are out of mutual respect and and are more equitable like that, I think they're more long lasting. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, that's really cool to, to hear that you've been able to do so much of that. Yeah. Yeah. It has, it's been, uh, it, it's been the, the experiences that I've gotten uh, to take part in be, uh, as a result of my writing, the people, the relationships uh, I have because of it are, are at least as gratifying as uh, the books themselves. Certainly. Certainly. So without divulging anything that you can't talk about yet, uh, is there anything in the future that you're particularly uh, able to tell us about? <laughs> well, I don't have any other book projects right now, um, but I have actually been focusing for the last year and a half or so on, uh, I, I decided I had lived for about 15 years in, that, in the world of abstract ideas. Uh, you know, I've been doing podcasting and writing and speaking about all these ideas. And I thought, you know, before my body gets to a place where I can't do it, uh, if I'm going to ever do any kind of work with my hands, I should probably get back to it. Um, and so I opened this 
a craft beer tap room here in Granbury, Texas called Brew Drinkery. Uh, and actually now I'm working on some uh, final steps in hopefully starting construction on a new uh, craft brewery uh, called Craft uh, Brew Old School Ale Works uh, that will also be here in uh, Granbury if everything works out. So Wow, well, how cool is that? That's exciting. Yeah. Yeah, it is kind of cool. Yeah, for me, uh, beer and theology have always gone kind of hand in hand. So it's nice to kind of create those spaces physically now and not just create those forums for conversation and, and discourse virtually. Very cool. Very cool. So Christian, it's really been great talking with you and getting to know your work and everything. And so um Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, where can people find you and, you know, find your books and your brewery if they want to learn more? Sure. Um, well, you can certainly find the, the new book, You Can't Ask That, on uh, Chalice Press's website, chalicepress.com, or uh, on Amazon, or if you are one of those uh, rare folks who still goes into bookstores, uh, there are, I believe, Barnes & Noble is carrying uh, the book as well. Um, and you can find all of my other books, uh, that are still in print, uh, at least online, uh, most any bookstore or by a uh, special order. Um, and you can find me on Instagram. It's just Christian Pyatt or Facebook Christian Pyatt as well, uh, or brew drinkery, uh, just B R E W, uh, drinkery, uh, on Facebook or Instagram. Um, or go to brewdrinkery.com and check out some photos uh, on the site of uh, the place that uh, we're building down here. It's, it's pretty exciting, and I love to share it. And if you come through Granbury, Texas, just south of Fort Worth, uh, come by, and uh, we can share a pint or a cup of coffee. And Well, that and would be awesome. I'll, I'll definitely look forward to that. And if anybody else is uh, in your neighborhood, I uh, hope they can make it. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I'd, I would welcome the opportunity to to sit down and have some real, you know, uh, meaningful conversations over a pint with anybody. Theology on tap, right? <laughs> exactly. Theology on tap. Yep. Once a That's month good. we do, we do that as well. So I'd <laughs> love to. All right, Christian. Well, thanks so much. It's been great talking with you and uh, best luck with your book and with your brewery. You bet. Thanks so much.